Okay, I think I have to go a bit outside of my 23 years in the history to talk about the long lines, uh, but don't worry, it's not going to be a complete history lesson I'm going to go run through. My point today is that everything uh, is new when it enters the market, uh, but history has a tendency to repeat itself, and it might not be different this time. So let's start uh, late 1700 in Holland when the first investment funds were set up. And this was a mean to diversify the risk associated with trade that Holland had with the rest of the world. Now, I've done the long lines, and now I can jump to 1924, uh, when the first open-ended mutual fund was set up in the United States. It was a clear benefit. A uh, single investor could easily diversify their risk and have professional managed their portfolio and hence also outsource the risk management. Following companies were time consuming and extremely difficult. There was no standardized accounting rules like IFRS back then and uh, hence very uh, time consuming. Five years later, uh, in 1929, there were 19 open-end mutual funds in the U.S., competing with almost 700 closed-end funds. Now, these closed-end funds were highly leveraged. And not that you remember what happened in 29, but you probably read about it. And at the end of the year, when the stock market crashed, being highly leveraged was slightly challenging. So the competition became a lot easier for the open-end mutual fund. And as follows, after a market correction, the regulators get busy. So we got new regulations in the early 1930s, and that opened up the space, and we got a lot more mutual fund, open-ended mutual fund, and a lot more asset under management. The only way to invest back then was by doing fundamental research. And uh, in 1934, uh, Mr. Graham and Dodd wrote the famous book, Security Analysis, a book that influenced a lot of investors back then and continue to invest a lot of investors today. Forty years ahead, in 1971, Wells Fargo set up the first index fund. It was for professional investors. But it was a concept that inspired Mr. John Bogle, a guy who probably wanted to be a sea captain because he calls his uh, staff crew. They have to eat in a galley and uh, the logo is a sailing ship. But anyway, he set up a Vanguard group and uh, launched his first retail index fund in 1976. And today, Vanguard are managing more than 4.5 trillion US dollars. And then came the 80s, uh, and in December 1982, two very important things happened. And here I was supposed to say I turned 14 and I was blooming, but now I had to say I turned 14 and started reading the Wall Street Journal. But anyway, Michael Bloomberg uh, launched his uh, Bloomberg Terminal. And now the use of easily accessible data opened a completely new range of opportunities but it was not for everyone. There was a corner office at the Morgan Stanley headquarter in New York where a bunch of people started to play with these new tools. And they introduced number crunching in a massive and systematic way. And statistical arbitrage was born. There had obviously been arbitrage trading before, but this was the first time that mathematical and statistical models were used in a systematic way. They had the data, they sat in the middle of the info flow, they had easy access to the market, and they had cheap execution. So for many, many years, they harvested super profit. However, when there is super profit, others will follow. And, uh, even though there were quite high barriers to entries, there was a fierce competition, but these guys managed to run their healthy margins for 10, 12 years. And as most of you will remember, 
uh, the dot-com boom in the late 90s had a major impact on the market. When Netscape went public in 1995, it was the first time a big firm went public without having a positive track record. Mutual funds got into trouble. For some of these mutual funds, these problems can be attributed to the fact that it was fundamentally difficult to calculate the value of these new companies. But these funds, however, quickly recouped their losses after the dot-com boom went bust. But for others, the problems were linked to their risk models and the use of modern portfolio theory. We heard earlier today about Markowitz, and in 1952, he published his paper, Portfolio Selections. And they were using it, and it created the challenge. And the challenge was that internet wasn't defined as a sector, and companies that had a large exposure to this new economy did not have the right classification. Neither was most of these companies included in any indices in the beginning, but then they did, and they got the double whammy. The first group I mentioned were the active managers. The second, the semi-active, using the index as a starting point. BGI, or Barclay Global Investors, was one of the la largest managers of that time, and they belonged to the second group. They had to completely change the risk model, and later they had to change their business model, and they became the biggest provider of ETFs. Now it's part of the BlackRock group. Now, if we jump 20 years forward, and Alexandra was alluding to this. Last year, the top five companies accounted for more than 50% of the return on NASDAQ 100, and the same thing goes for the MSA Asia Apex. Such a concentrated rally doesn't happen very often. Mutual funds can typically not own more than 10% of a company, and a lot of so-called active funds in this space runs over and underweights relative to a benchmark. Since it's almost impossible to go overweight these companies, there is a tendency to be underweight constantly. I'm not going to go into a long argument, but my prediction for the future is that the strategy of going overweight and underweight relative to a benchmark is a dying breed. Now, back again to the years of the dot-com, Online trading became normal, and that meant that frequent trading and information flow that used to be reserved for the few now became available for everyone. And again, as economic theory predicts, when everyone has the same information and access, the advantage and economic super profit disappears. Around the same period, exchanges became fully electronic, and the US stock market stopped using fractions and discovered the easiness of decimals. And this was also important as the implication were lower spreads. And tight spreads is of paramount importance if you want to trade frequently. And more frequently we did trade. And it was the back of this, the new technology, the easier access to the market, News flow that a new breed of model-based investment was born. And in came the Quants. And they selected securities using advanced quantitative models and customized software programs to determine their investments. The public started to talk about this in 2005, and subsequently there was a massive inflow into these strategies. But it had started years before. For the first years, like the StatArb, all the strategies were run by in-house trading firms. And as we have seen before, there was a massive first mover advantage. And participants were making healthy margins. But it didn't last for long when cab drivers started recommending quant strategies in early 2007. 
it only took seven months before we had a quant meltdown later that year. Many of these new quant strategies was just variation of the Statarb strategies invented 20 years earlier, but they were refined. But even if refined, the risk models were still not able to foresee what was going on. They had not taken into account the system risk that was building up, nor the concentration risk. The ones not wiped out in late 2007 had an extremely difficult time during the financial crisis. The financial crisis that by some are claimed to be a 100-year event that, according to my calculation, we have had four of during the last 100 years. The good thing with, with these events is that they are very good for active management. And uh, the time after the financial crisis was a golden period for active management. Now, during 2008, the market volume reached an all-time high, and it took almost seven years before we got back to the same level. The Statarb strategies that came 20 years earlier typically had investment horizon of months, weeks, and in some few cases, days. The longer the period, the smaller the number of positions you need. But again, faster internet lines, faster computers, lower fees, all leads to new strategies. And when the money started flooding into these quant strategies in 05, the geeks on the prop desk started looking for other opportunities and high frequency trading was born. And during the years from 2007 to 2011, the best high frequency trading firms made money in such a consistent way is it is almost impossible to believe. They were running strategies that made money every day for 9 to 12 months at a time. But financial market evolution means that if there is super profit, it will be dealt with. In addition to more players squeezing the margin, you had also new innovation to deal with this stated problem. The IEX, known from Michael Lewis' book Flashboy, is a stock exchange that opened for trading in October 2013. It was there to deal with the algorithm of the high frequency traders. And what was the innovation? It was a 38 mile long coil of fiber optic cable placed in front of their trading engine. That coil created a 350 millisecond delay. Around these years, there was a lot of talk about in the market about how, how these new players were distorting the market and questioning the future of trading. But think about it. How many news articles have you read about high-frequency trading the last 18 to 24 months? There's not that many. But they're still there. As you can see from the chart, it's almost 60% of the market trading volume today. It is now made available to the public. And the two big winners in this space is the early prop trading firms, and now it's the infrastructure providers. Because this is a race to zero, and the marginal improvements get smaller and smaller, and the costs get higher and higher. And what is the latest trend of systematic strategies? Smart beta. In my view, often neither smart nor beta, but we can leave that for another day. But smart beta was a term coined back in 2013, and it's mixing index management with some overlay quant strategies. If we say it differently, they're trying to capture investment factors of market inefficiency in a rule-based way. But this time it's different. However, Given the rise and fall of similar strategies, why would one believe that this time it's not going to be crowded and the profit to be marginalized? It's probably too early to conclude, but the most popular strategies going into 2017 was the minimum vol strategy. 
the worst performing strategy of 2017, the minimum bull strategy. Lagging 17 percentage points of the best performing, which was the momentum. Factory strategies can be an excellent addition to anybody's portfolio. You just have to be aware of the risk, especially those who have been run by in-house trading desk for some time, and those that becomes very popular. And more of them will come as the computer gets better, the lines get faster, and the cost of transaction comes down. And while speaking of transaction costs, just before I started in this industry, the law in Norway set a minimum commission level of 0.75%. Now compare that to this ad from Nordea a month ago. But lower transaction fee is not only lowering the overall trading cost and increasing the universe of products, it is also changing the way and when people save. Just to give you one example, Alibaba, a company that probably most of you have heard about. Now, people were encouraged to keep their money in the system when buying and selling things on the Alibaba platform using Alipay. The little guy is the logo for Ant Financials. It now incorporates payment and saving. By allowing customers to set up an e-wallet linked to a money market fund, they have now created the world's largest money market fund of more than 200 billion US dollars. You can pay at Starbucks using your money market fund money. It was totally unheard of only a few years back because the transaction cost would have killed the setup. We're moving towards a frictionless financial market and the implication of that is massive. You can think about all the strategies you heard about in school from finance professors, genius ideas where it's not for the fact when you introduce transaction costs they did not work. But without transaction costs, who knows. Now, initially I promised myself not to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but Financial Times had this uh, wonderful graph uh, at the end of the year. So, and you might think I'd be in hibernation if I didn't mention it at all. So here we go. I don't know if it's a bubble. It certainly looks like a bubble. Uh, but the definition of a bubble is when prices moves too far away from its fundamental value. And if anybody can tell me what the fundamental value of Bitcoin is, then I might give you an answer. Because the only value of Bitcoin is how much people are willing to pay. Now the latest figures shows that 95% of Bitcoin investors are men. <laughs> now, 90% of men thinks they're better or smarter than the average. So by my cal calculation, I only offended 2% of the people in this room. Anyway, in addition, the higher the price of Bitcoin, the keener the energy burning competition to produce more Bitcoin. Last week, 0.17% of the world's energy production were used to mine Bitcoin. That is up from 0.14% mid-December. For those of you who remember the words of Albert Einstein, the most powerful force in the world is the compounding interest. Now, with the growth rate of the last three months of more than 32% per month, 100% of the world's energy production will be used to mine Bitcoin in February 2020. Now, thankfully, we will have the conference in January, so we might still have lights. Anyway, the early promises of Bitcoin was of an efficient, near frictionless, decentralized currency. If we look at this chart 
and the increase in transaction cost lately. It seems like frictionless, it is not. The second most valuable cryptocurrency is Ripple. It's a centralized cryptocurrency and it claims one frictionless experience to send money globally. Now the founder of Ripple is now said to be worth more than 50 billion US dollars. It's hard to figure it can be completely frictionless. In my previous life, I was fortunate enough to be part of a group that founded Plato Partnership. It's a non-for-profit entity with the purpose of making the market better. And it was the first time that buy and sell side came together. Infrastructure that used to be centralized became decentralized. It did take out a lot of cost from the market, but we are at the point now where it's adding cost. And the industry needs to come together to reduce the friction and costs related to payment, settlement, transaction, etc. Now, Skagen is now a founding partner of Plato, and Plato has a cooperation with the London Stock Exchange and its Turquoise. Turquoise Plato Block Discovery is a multilateral trading facility aimed at facilitating block trading. And as you might remember from an earlier slide, High frequency trading still accounts for up to 60% of the market, but they trade in small size. This is for the lot of bigger trades. And even though that the volume chart for uh, Turquoise Plato looks a bit like the price chart of Bitcoin, and I can assure you there's fundamental value behind this. What we're trying to do is to take out the friction. The cooperation between Plato and Turquoise started in November 2016. And instead of competing on infrastructure setup, we're competing on giving the best outcome for the clients. And it's working. Excess cash from this operation will be used on market structure research. And for 2017, it looks like almost two million pounds sterling can be used for that. Now, as technology is evolving and improving, we are getting close to the physical limits when it comes to speed to access to the market. We're talking about nanoseconds, not microseconds anymore. The risk systems are getting more advanced and the hunt for performance gets more intensified. So what is the implication? In 1996, almost 7,500 companies were listed in US. Now it's close to 4,000 companies. But the number of tickers you can trade remains almost the same. And the difference belongs to ETFs and ETNs, exchange traded notes and exchange traded funds. The majority of these are plain vanilla trackers, but more and more exotic strategies are listed as ETFs. Of course, this is natural. If you are to survive as an ETF provider, you need to attract assets. And how do you do that in a market where there's already thousands of other ETFs? You need to be different. And the fierce competition in this market leads me to predict that many of these ETFs lifespan will become shorter and shorter. Another thing that scares me with the growth in the ETF industry is all the product trying to make illiquid instrument liquid. When the ETFs becomes more liquid than the underlying securities, we might have a problem if something happened. And to add to this craziness, as of Monday this week, SSC in the regulators in the US had received filings for 23 ETFs based on Bitcoin. 15 of those has the future as the underlying. Three has the physical Bitcoin, whatever that is. And three 
are leveraged ETFs, meaning you will get two or three times the return if not Bitcoin was exciting enough at the start. So what are the coming trends in the industry? Robot-wise has been around for a while, but I think it's going to continue to affect the industry. Now Skagen dipped its toe uh, into robot-wise during last year, but as the rest of the industry, we, we probably only released less than 10% of the potential. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are the next big thing. And if you couple that with robot-wise, it can also hugely benefit clients. Machine learning is already used largely in the quant industry. And these machines are set up to win. But if all the players in the market are machines, the machines must then be set up to predict the moves of other machines. Some of you might have watched the World Championship in Rapid and Bliss chess during the holiday. So it's like two chess computers going head to head. And the end result of that is normally a remis. But in the same fashion, super profit in the market cannot continue for these machines either. But given my reference to chess, some of you probably saw that Google's AlphaZero destroyed Stockfish in a 100 game match of chess a month ago. Now, for those of you not familiar with AlphaZero, it's an artificial intelligent program, and as such, it is not pre programmed. And for those of you not familiar with Stockfish, it was until a month ago the best chess computer out there. It took AlphaZero four hours to learn chess and then started competing against Stockfish. It won 28 of the matches and had a draw in the other 72. So what if you take such an artificial intelligence program and apply it to the financial market? Well, again, there might be super profit in the short term, but it's likely to comp be competed away in the medium to longer term until the winner takes it all. However, current results suggest that there might not be any super profit. The first artificial intelligence driven ETF was launched in October last year. It's the blue line. It leads me to believe that this computer program started searching internet for ideas and maybe academic articles on the subject of alpha creation, and decided that hmm, it's rational to underperform the market. <laughs> when we meet again in a year or two, hopefully with lights also in year two, I am confident we will have experienced something we will remember in the lines of the dot-com boom, the quant meltdown, or equal. Due to the fact that investors are becoming less concerned about fundamentals and more concerned about technicals, I have no idea where, it's will, where it will hit us, but we will feel it when it does. But the good thing is, this is the way the market tells us we are wrong, and as it always do, it will correct our mistakes. And markets will continue to evolve but if you want to play the new, new thing, be there very early. And there's still a place for doing what Graham and Dodd told us to do more than 80 years ago. You can say it like Axel Rose, and probably supported by Nick Leeson, the man that single-handedly took down Bering Bank in 1996, trading the Nikkei future. All you need is just a little patience. But I want to leave you with the words of a man with a, a much better track record than Nick Leeson, Mr. Warren Buffett. And with that, I say thank you for your patience.